So, um, Kayla, thanks so much for coming on the webinar and talking um, to us. Um, this is going to be all about insurance. We'll take all sorts of questions from the audience. So just use the Q&A feature on Zoom for that, pop them in the Q&A function, we'll answer them as we go. So before we start, could you just give us a bit of a background on, on yourself with cars and insurance? So, so we know kind of know where you're coming from. Yeah, definitely, Robert. Look, firstly, thank you so much for the opportunity. It's lovely to uh, to have the chance to come on and, and have a bit of a yarn about about insurance, so thank you for the opportunity. Um, me, cars and insurance, I guess uh, probably just over 20 years in insurance. So started sort of when I was about 19, I guess. Um, been through all sorts of different products and different roles, predominantly um, at Suncorp. So have worked with various different brands such as AAMI, GIO, um, have you know, done some work with Shannon's uh, and different brands uh, such as CIL, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. uh, across all sorts of different product sets, I guess. So statutory like CTP and workers' comp, motor insurance, um, commercial and personal. So a bit of a long history in insurance, I guess, sort of fell into it. Um, was it didn't grow up dreaming to be in it, but uh, uh, it's been an exciting ride for the, for the 20 years. And I guess the last five have probably been um, the most exciting for me. So uh, having the opportunity to jump out of a large corporate um, and come and start up, uh, you know, a bespoke brand in Club 4x4, which allows me to combine, you know, those sort of 20 or so years of insurance experience with a passion that I've had as long as I can remember around anything mechanical. So Fantastic. Mm. Yeah, so I mean, cars, cars are in my upbringing. So uh, all sorts of different machinery, two-wheeled, four-wheeled, fast, um, Sort of fast, probably more more oh, okay. more adept than capable on on dirt. So uh, yeah, I feel really blessed to be in a position where I can combine my work with a passion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know if we'll call it a Vaptor fast. You, sh you showed me that Integra early on. I called that. <laughs> All right. So, so let's start with let's start with some of the basics then. So what actually is insurance at a fundamental level here? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it, look, it's good to see it from from two sides. So at a consumer level, I think what we often forget as consumers, I'm, I'm a consumer too, so what we often forget as consumers is that insurance is not just that painful grudge process that you usually go through once a year where you do the ring around, you get a renewal, you look at the renewal, value has gone down, price has gone up or, or vice versa. And that horrible grudge moment where you think, Jesus, this is something that I need to pay. What's right? What's wrong? This price is too much. Everyone has, you know, financial pressures and different challenges in their life. What you're actually buying with insurance, and, and this is the part that's really lost in us because yeah. that, that consumerism takes over. What you're really buying is protection for an asset. So, you know, if we, if we think about it, uh, you know, the, the Raptor behind me, you know, $72,000 off the showroom floor, probably got about $20,000 in mods. Mm -hmm. Um, what you're buying with insurance with a car is the ability to give yourself peace of mind that if it gets damaged, yeah. have someone that's going to help you carry the burden of repairing that vehicle. If it gets total lost, it's even more important because it's, such a, it's, it's often the second largest asset that someone owns in their lifetime. So how would you replace that? So you're protecting yourself against perils that happen in life um, you know, from a financial perspective. So it's from a consumer point of view, you, you need to, to understand that that piece of paper, which unfortunately, um, or, or fortunately for most, is, is, is the tangible piece that comes out of that interaction with an insurer or an insurance agency, mm -hmm. that piece of paper is a promise. So the promise is to get you back to where you were should an asset get damaged. It's much the same with home insurance, life insurance. So these are all opportunities for you to protect yourself against perils in life. So from a consumer perspective, it's important to remember that what you're buying is that promise. What you need to ask yourself in that process, is that promise enough to get me back to where I was? Okay. So that's from a consumer perspective. Yeah, yeah. From, from an insurance perspective, it's a little bit from an insurer's perspective. So we are an agency. 
yeah. uh, we have a fantastic underwriter in Holland. So from an insurance perspective, it's about how does, how, how does the organization manage a portfolio of business that can, that, that, that can um, fulfill that promise, so to speak. Mm. I often talk about insurance as a community funded concept. Um, a seventy thousand dollar Raptor might cost you two thousand dollars to insure. It might cost you a thousand dollars to insure. One day, that portfolio needs to pay that seventy thousand dollars out potentially. Mm. So your pool of clients put in their contributions towards that pool, and that pool then needs to be able to uh, be sufficient enough to pay out for the damage and the claims that might happen, whether it's damage or a total loss. So that's that's the battle from an insurer's perspective around managing that portfolio. Okay, so basically insurers got to collect enough premiums to, and that's going to look at the risk and size. So if we've got a thousand people mm -hmm. and on average, one of them is going to crash every year and that costs us a thousand dollars a time, then we've got to collect a dollar from each person. And Correct. then on top of that, we then need to allow for profit and everything else like that. So we better make it dollar fifty, etc. So in other words, you've got I think they're called underwriters who constantly look at what the risk is, which is what is the chances we're going to have to pay out the claim and how big the claim, and then they set the premiums based on that. Absolutely. So that, that data is monitored regularly. Uh, and, you know, it, it's there, there's two pieces there as well. So you know you alluded to profit. So in running a portfolio of insurance, that 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 money will never be enough to pay out all of the risk. Yeah. But what an insurer will do, so our underwriter will do, they will invest that money to maximise uh, to, to, you know, to, to maximize that pool to be able to pay it out, but also to maximise their ability to make profit out of that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So, so you know, the, the, there's a couple of angles there. But you know, the, our pricing teams at our underwriter will regularly review claims performance uh, to make sure that, you know, claims performance... Uh, investment revenue and also market forces. There are other sort of macro financial forces that play an effect on these sorts of things too. But it's a it's a continuous process, making yeah. sure the premium is adequate. A bit of jargon there. Okay, cool. All right. And um, what are the different types of vehicle insurance? There's there's third party and there's fully comprehensive. Um, are there any other types, and how do they differ? Yeah, look, I mean, if we think about asset insurance, so motor insurance is covering a motor vehicle as an asset, yeah. there would be comprehensive, which covers yeah. you for the damage that um, you incur to your own vehicle, but also potentially to the third party where you're at fault. So, you know, if you have a nose to tail, that's your fault. Um, you know, that, that policy will cover the front end damage to your car and the rear end damage to the other person's car. Okay. Third party property damage, which still exists, um, you know, is a product that covers you not for the damage to your vehicle, but for the damage to someone else. So more commonly found where the vehicle is not worth a whole lot or the person might have, you know, a larger financial burden in life and they choose to cover themselves only for the damage to someone else. I mean, if you think about, uh, you know, if you think about rear-ending a brand new Mercedes, um, you know, that could really set you back in life a long time if you don't have any insurance. Yeah. So the market has that lower level coverage so that at least you can find yourself in a position to cover for the damage that you may cause to someone else. Um, so from an asset pr protection perspective, when we think about car insurance, they're the two key ones. Um, but, you know, there's obviously different subsets within, within each. Okay. All right, cool. So if we move on to four-wheel drive insurance, then and specifically four-wheel drive touring insurance, what mm -hmm. makes... Um, four-wheel drive touring insurance like the Raptor you've got behind in my Ranger modified going off-road what's different about it from an insurance perspective so I, I think it's good to take a step back from your question a little bit now the subsets that I alluded to before so if we think about comprehensive insurance the market has you know niche products and niche brands out there uh, and niche products that will actually tailor to specific portions of the market. So, you know, there's, there's, there's insurance products for motoring enthusiasts, there's insurance products for um, people of a certain age group, there's insurance products that are specialized in trailers. So th th there are a raft and a number of products, brands, 
uh, out there that tailor to the individual market. I guess what what's Club 4x4 was created to do was to tailor for a niche in the market that wasn't really catered for appropriately. Right? At the core of it, I believe that we are motoring enthusiasts because the car is the vehicle that gets us to the dream. The dream is to go to those places that you can't get to yeah, yeah. in a two-wheel drive vehicle. So the, 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 the product is designed and bespoke for people who will buy a vehicle off the showroom floor, will invest at times 150% of that vehicle's value in modifications, uh, accessories, uh, and making it fit for purpose for touring. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's, and it's also tailored to that person then taking that motor vehicle and using it for its purpose. Okay. Yeah, okay, so covering accessories, first of all, mm-hmm. um, from my perspective, what I've seen is there's two problems. One is that um, the average insurer will say, look, um, the market value of your vehicle is, say, $30,000, or let's say $40,000, and we can insure it for the market value, or we can go for an agreed value, which might be no more than 10, 15% of the market value. Now, from a four-wheel drive perspective, if you've got a $40,000 vehicle, you might have, let's say, $20,000 worth of accessories. So if it gets written off, then you're $60,000 in the hole, but your insurance only covers you for 40. So for me, one of the big differences is that you've got to have an um, insurance policy which actually covers the full cost of your accessories there. Well, look, if we go back to what you asked at the right, right at the beginning about what an insurance product is, this is a fundamental thing. So that, that promise and that protection that I, that, that I mentioned, the protection and the, the promise comes from what you're insured for. Yeah. All right. So, um, you know, someone might have a, a stock Raptor or a stock range of wild track or a stock 80 series. Uh, and that's fine. Um, well, the 80 series I'll get back to in a second, but you know, if the vehicle's not modified, the general insurance will, market will generally cover for that. But where you are investing in those modifications and those accessories, you're absolutely right. The question that needs to be asked is in the purchase of that promise, and in the purchase of that security, is the security enough for what I need? Now, in the case of a lot of, a lot of our customers uh, or a lot of the people that might be watching this, is it's not because you could well be in the hole. Um, so it, it, yeah, the, the, the value that you're insured for is an incredibly important part of making your decision. And you're right, the general market might give you a 10 or 15 or 20% buffer on top of what the, the catalogued agreed value for that vehicle might be, and that might be, might be enough for some people, um, but that's yeah. what you've got to consider. With the 80, the other thing that, that I'm going to say, so, yeah. uh, you know, you think about an 80 series, um, you think about uh, a TD42 GQ or even a GU. These are vehicles, whether they're modified or not, they're bucking the trend now in value. Yeah. Um, so, you know, an insurer will use a data source such as Glasses Guide or Redbook, which we do, we use Redbook. Um, but often, uh, you know, a clean um, TD42 GQ with low mileage, the value that Redbook will give you is nowhere near what it needs to be. That's another consideration. So will your insurer step outside of the bounds of those guiding points of these data sources? And will they understand what a TD42 um, you know, GQ is even as a starting point yeah. to actually go to that next step and say, well, and I had one today, I'll give you a great example. So we, we, we actually had a TD42 GQ today, um, quite a neat unit. It was purchased for $22,000. The glasses guide was 12. The maximum for, for glasses guide was 12. Yeah. Uh, and, and we were able to get to the 22 by citing yeah. some photos, you know, doing a bit of a showcase of the car, looking yeah. at the kilometres. Uh, Look, uh, this is when I say what's different about uh, a bespoke insurer, regardless of what the niche is that it's targeting, it's the knowledge and the understanding of what you're going to do with your vehicle Mm -hmm. and being able to cover you in the right way with that knowledge. Yeah. Okay. 
Got it, got it. Okay, so um, you've got your four-wheel drive, Dan, um, it's accessorised, and um, uh, it's got 20Ks of stuff, and you say, all right, um, here's 20,000, and it's gone from 40 to 60, you've insured it for 60. Mm -hmm. How important is it to declare what the modifications and everything else um, are, and what's the implications if you don't? So, really good question. So, this will be dependent on the insurer. So, some insurers will ask you to list out in, in, in great detail what that $20,000 is made up of. Some of them won't. Um, some of them will have very specific conditions on certain types of modifications that they absolutely will not cover. Yeah. Uh, but that will make that very evident through the, the, the questioning process, so the underwriting process. Um, you, know, you might see things like nitrous or, or a roll cage or, or things like that. So that's the sort of exclusion that I'm talking about. Okay. So look, you're going to be guided by, by, the, by the company that you're, that, you're, um, that you're interacting with there. Yeah, because uh, I, I advise people to be very specific about what it is. So if you've got an Ironman bull bar, say it's an Ironman yes. steel bull bar, not just <coughs> a bull bar, because otherwise you could get one off eBay and say, well, look, you said it was a bull bar, so we've just got you Joe Random eBay bull bar. Here you go. You go, no, no, it was an ARB Sahara bar. Well, you didn't tell us that. So. Yeah, yeah, a little bit different, a little bit different. So, yeah, look, that's that fair advice or not? No, no, I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, but again, it's dependent, you know, like, and I, I don't want to be talking too much about our product, but, yeah. but with us, what I will say is there will be certain uh, points where we will request a list and photos. Yeah. But there'll also be certain points where we won't. It'll be dependent on the vehicle to modification value, yeah. uh, you know. Uh, but look, at, we've got an assessing team that, amongst them, you know, have 120 or 130 years of of assessing experience. Uh, and from a claims perspective, you know, we're very intent on ensuring that what 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 we're assessing at the panel shop is what we replace with as yeah. a bare minimum. Um, but yeah, look at from from the front end, be guided by the by the insurer uh, and one thing that i'll probably say this a few times tonight if there's any gray don't let it be gray make it black and white ask the question uh because you know information and knowledge is, is power i think that's said a lot these days but yeah, yeah. with this sort of product uh with what we like to do as as enthusiasts it's incredibly important to remove as much gray as possible okay so tip one is um declare all of your accessories and modifications and yep. figure out what it would cost you to replace the car um, as is and then, then go for that okay good um, now the next one is roadworthiness so um, uh, would would it insurers um, still cover a car if it was involved in an accident but not roadworthy and that, that's kind of a big broad question I know mm. Um, so let, let's take it in one part. Let's say that the tyres were 50 mil um, out. There should have been no more than plus, plus two inches. They're three inches tall, something like, like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Look, I, I think, again, you need to be guided by your insurer. So yeah. the, you know, the, the PDS that's available on every insurer's website is a good starting point, but also ask the question. Right? So there isn't, an, a, there isn't a product or PDS in the land that, expects vehicles to be roadworthy, right? So, but yeah, from, from my perspective personally, I know how challenging roadworthiness is in this country. Mm. So, you know, having a chair on the four-wheel drive council as part of the AAAA, you know, we're, we're always working very hard to try and drive synergy across the different states. Now, you might have a car that's totally legal in New South Wales where I am, and you'll drive up north and it won't be because of some small difference in what, how Queensland do things. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a very challenging space for us as four-wheel drive enthusiasts to navigate. Um, from club's perspective, there needs to be a contribution. So, uh, you know, if, if your vehicle is not roadworthy and it could have contributed to that incident, then there'll be an issue. Right. Now, if yeah. you're too tall, you know, you've, gone, you've gone 35s and you put three inches of lift, that's pretty much illegal anywhere in the country. Um, and you, uh, you know, back into a bollard in a car park, so we're not going to hunt you down for that. Um, that's not the intent of the policy. Now, if you roll that car, then you've got a much greater centre of gravity, um, which could have contributed to that. 
Now, if you had it engineered, it's a stock car as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, okay. Uh, but, you know, that, that's, right. that's, that's how we work it. Yeah, because the example I give people is um, if you've got a car on, let's say, 37s, you haven't engineered it and it's hail damaged, your insurer will probably pay out for the hail. But if you tipped it going around the corner, um, that's different. Because I've read up with your insurance oddmansman and it's... Correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me that insurance companies can only refuse a claim if whatever it is actually contributed to it. That seems to be the ruling. Um, no? I, 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 yeah, look, I know what we do. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't go as far as saying that that would be the case everywhere else, and I don't want to seem slanderous. Yeah. Uh, that's definitely not the intent, Robert. But, you know, I, I would certainly ask the question, um, so yeah, look, that that's kind of probably where I'd leave that one, mate. Okay. I, I think it, it, you you've got to be quite careful with that sort of thing. Yeah. All right. And okay. So the next question then is, if someone declares a modification, say, look, I've got a thirty-five inch, I've got thirty-fives, I've got a three-inch lift, but the insurance company says okay, and they insure it. Um, could they then come back and go, you know what, um, actually it turns out you were, you weren't right with it. So if, if we're talking about any insurer, then yeah. my answer would be yes. So the, yeah, the, there will be companies out there that will take a harder line on these things and, and find ways, or, or yeah. I mean, find ways is probably not the right way of saying it, but mm. take a much harder stance on roadworthiness. Yeah. Um, so you can't rely on that. So take the grey away yeah. and ask the question and get black and white. Yeah, but I have to say, if you, if you have specifically said, hey, general insurer, I have 35-inch mm -hmm. tyres and a 3-inch lift, and they've gone, and you've just emailed out to them, you've got the policy back and it's listed on it, um, then, the, then to my mind, the grey is taken away, even though that vehicle is not actually roadworthy. Um, and to me, that's kind of, well, that, that, that's, a, yeah, that's a question I've always wondered about. Yeah, look, I think it's always nice to have things on paper. Yeah, yeah. But I think I'd go one step further there. Yeah. So it's not enough to say that I've got it because if we go back to what I was saying before, yeah. I would question how many people would understand what 35s and exactly. a three inch lift would, would, would mean. Yeah, so that's, great. That, yeah. that's, where, that's where you still might have a challenge. And, you know, if you do want to go with someone that you feel doesn't know what that means, then if, you, if you're relying on documentation, then I would be super specific about the question uh, and, and seek a response that's going to give you adequate comfort, which is, yes, 35s and 3-inch, they're on there. Um, we recognise that that's not legal, but you'll be covered. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, good. Um, yeah, because I, I have seen people say, if I've declared it, it will mm. always be insured, and I've never really been comfortable with that because when push comes to shove the insurance company might say look roadworthiness our roadworthiness clause trumps whatever you've told us so yeah. that's 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 what i would say uh taking the club hat off and being a consumer yeah. um I, I wouldn't rely I, I wouldn't rely on it so okay. uh, i'd always err on the side of caution all right cool all right we've got a question from greg we'll get we'll get to that in a moment um, um greg uh so next question then is um to do with um, claims because, you know, especially see it at tracks, people always say, oh, um, don't worry, tow it out to the nearest corner and pretend it crashed there, etc." Mm -hmm. And the amount of times I've had to people say, no, look, don't do it. There's a number of reasons. First of all, you're dealing with really savvy claims assessors and they will smell it about a thousand kilometers away. Secondly, if you get caught and you probably will, it's like a criminal record and it's not worth it. So, yeah. so what's your view on, on this? Um, look, I, I think it, it's, this is all about risk. Yeah. Yeah. This is all about risk. So uh, you're absolutely right. If you are found to be in a position where, um, you know, you, 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 you claim is fraudulent or you're, you're found to have been fraudulent in your representations on, on anything, uh, as part of an insurance contract, you know, the, 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 the implications are dire. So the first point is, you know, you, you lose the coverage of that asset. So you're up for the whole cost of that asset potentially mm -hmm. if the insurer goes down that path. Mm -hmm. And then the long-term implications of having to tell every other insurer after that, 
that you've had a claim declined for fraud, that has massive implications down the track. You know, for us, for example, if, if, if anyone answers yes to that question, we can't insure them mm. under our binder agreement with our underwriter. Mm. So, look, uh, you know, my view is take the time to understand the product that you're taking out. Uh, you know, it, it might be 10% more expensive. It might be 10% less expensive. It might be 20% more expensive. I think everyone needs to take the time to assess the risk. Mm. So uh, assess the risk of what you're doing and assess what it might look like if you know that your insurer is not going to like the fact that you are below the tide line on a beach uh, and you're going to get knocked back. Assess that risk. Mm. Uh, are you willing to take that risk? Can you fund the $30,000 total loss? as well as the $3,000 recovery fee to get it off the beach or whatever it might be, depending on where you are. Yeah. Uh, you know, I can't advise for uh, anything you're saying, obviously, yeah. um, but there are coverages out there on the market that can tailor for your need where you don't need to do that. Hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah, because why I look at it is if you do make a dodgy <clears throat> insurance claim, then first of all, you're not going to be covered, so then you've lost your asset. You've got to cover your asset then you've got all the implications of having to tell every other insurer you don't be done for fraud and possibly criminal um, damages as well because it is fraud. So it's actually a really bad idea. Um, and whilst it's really tempting, the risks of getting caught are so high, it's just something I was trying to, you know, I, I, don't, I, I don't like the concept of fraud anyway, but this is a particularly dumb one, I think, for people to try. So. Particularly where, you know, like I said before, you can have the coverage that suits your needs yeah. without any grey anymore. Yeah. So you well, know, well, 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 let's talk about that now. Then, so let's say that we're a touring four-wheel drive. <laughs> then um, we've talked about the accessories. So we got to the point where we're insuring the vehicle with all of its accessories um, for a value. So instead of a forty-thousand-dollar vehicle, we're pushing it to forty-five. We've got the full sixty, sixty-five. So that's ticked. Yep. Now we've got to talk about where we take it and what we do. Um, with it. So obviously four wheel drivers, we drive on bitumen, um, mm. we drive on beaches, we, st I mean, it's called bush bashing, but that's not the case. We should be on gazetted tracks. Oh, we yeah. might be on, on private property. And, you know, like your examples there, which is um, on a beach, potentially below the high, the, the high, high water mark, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so I know that a good four wheel drive insurance policy just says anywhere on Australia and then there's no restriction, right? Okay. Yeah. So the, the yeah. So I, I guess your question is geographic coverage. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, incredibly important for us because you know the blacktop is what we use to get to the gravel or the dirt or the snow or the water or the sand or yeah. the mud. Um, so you know obviously the blacktop is a basic and a given. Um, there's no motor insurance policy that doesn't cover you on blacktop out there. The 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 the, the point that I often make at talks and presentations is. Um, gazetted versus non-gazetted. So what, what does gazetted mean? Uh, and often people come back and say, you know, it's a, it's a government recognised uh, and mapped road, which is a reasonable expect, uh, ex explanation, and I, and I agree with that. My next question um, to anyone is, when you have a claim that is not on a gazetted road, or when you have a claim at all, where you are not on blacktop, who is determining whether it's gazetted or not? Mm. So let's say, I'll give you give you an example. So you've had your claim, you call the claims officer, you tell them I had this accident on this track or this road. So is that person going to know that it's gazetted or not? Is it going to matter? Uh, and what challenges is that going to pose for you? Are you going to be in a position where, you know, the burden of proof is on yourself to fight with an organisation about what gazetted or not gazetted is. Mm -hmm. um, look, bush bashing, yes, that's definitely not the intent, but you often do find yourself in a situation where, you know, you go for a little bit of an explore. You may or may not know that that's not gazetted, where you're driving. Right? You know, if, you're, if you're coming off a, a marked track out into the bush, that's very clear, but you might find yourself in a position where you inadvertently find yourself in a space where it is not a gazetted road. So do you want the burden of proof? 
um, on that? Or do you want to feel comfortable that you're covered anywhere, including private property? I mean, four-wheel drive parks are a big part of, uh, you know, what we do as four-wheel drive enthusiasts. Are you covered on a private property um, at a four-wheel drive park? You yeah. know, these are all questions you need to ask. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, if it's just anywhere in Australia, then that takes, as you said before, that takes the grey out of it, and then you don't need to worry about exactly where. Yeah, private property. We do a lot of high-risk driving on private property, yeah. Um, correct, yeah. correct. And look, ask the question. You know, a lot of people will say, oh, you're covered anywhere in Australia. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Where you're allowed to be or whatever, or you know, however the, the individual on the phone might want to frame it. Yeah. Um, ask another two or three questions. Go into that second and third drawer. Ask them about non gazetted Ask them about private property. Okay. Um, you know, these are important things that, that, that you need to be sure of. Okay, good. So now, so we've got our vehicle insured. It's covered for all the accessories and modifications. We've declared all of that. Um, and we are now free to drive it anywhere in Australia. Um, so next thing to think about is the contents because your average car, road car, probably contains... I don't know, um, not much, to be honest, where people are actually keeping in their car. I'm just thinking of my cars, um, my road cars. There's not a lot in there. There's um, no. maybe, a, I don't know, a, a sat-nav unit, um, rubber mats, that's about it. And if I think about my four-wheel drive, that could have a lot of gear in it. So mm. your average car insurance policy is not going to cover all of the kit inside your car, is it? No, a really important consideration. Now, while you were talking, I was just thinking this is we were out bush last week with the with the family and the tray in the back of that thing had four camping chairs, a recovery kit, uh, a compressor, recovery ramps, um, all, all manner of tools uh, and bits and bobs to keep us going. You're right. I mean, how, how would you cover that? Uh, you know, there are some home insurance policies out there that depending on the grade of home insurance policy you take, there are some really nice products out there that will cover that sort of um, those sorts of belongings away from the home, but you need to know that. So you know the way I like to frame this, Robert, is um, you know if you peel the roof off your four B and turn it upside down, everything that falls out, including what I just mentioned, sat navs, UHF radios, well handheld UHF radios. There's a lot of gear that we take on us when we go take with us when we're going on a trip. Mm. So contents. Um, most motor insurance policies on the market at the moment have a uh, what they call a personal valuables coverage. Um, and that's, you know, there'll be different variations of that wording. It'll range from 500 to, I think the highest for that is about $1,000 on, on the market at the moment. That coverage kicks in if a if an item that's in the vehicle gets damaged as a result of a claimable event. Now, what that means is, um, and I'm trying to think of an example here. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to give one that might be a little bit out there, but okay. say you have a large nose to tail, yeah. your dash cam falls off its mount and, and, and gets damaged um, in the process of that accident. You've had the accident, which is a recognised claim. Yeah. You can then claim on that 500 to to $1,000, depending on your insurer, you can claim on that because it was damaged as part of a claimable event. Got it. Yeah, yeah. Now, most insurance products in Australia have that. I think all of them do. Okay. The difference is, do you have a contents coverage that will cover you where it wasn't damaged as part of a claimable event? Mm. So if you, um, you know, if, if you dropped your camera would, how would you cover that? If someone pinched the fridge out of the back of the ute, how would you cover that? So there are products out there that do have that coverage. Ours is one of them. Yeah. Um, so this is a cover that will cover you for um, theft, damage or loss to those portable items sitting in your motor vehicle while you're out touring whether it's with the car or not. So again, it's yeah. asking the question. Yeah, so, so, so you could have your $40,000 car $20,000 worth of accessories and then easily five, maybe even 10. Cause mm -hmm. I mean, if you think about it, you put a fridge in there, a couple of handhelds, um, um, a laptop computer, um, a set of max tracks, um, 
you know, um, soft shackles are not cheap these days, that sort of thing. It, it all tends to add up pretty quick. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, okay. Now, let's talk a bit about um, uh, recovery. So that, yeah, yeah, in the outback somewhere and the car just fails and i'm not talking bogged here i'm talking engine is blowing up or something like, or, or perhaps you've rolled it or whatever the case may be you can't drive it anymore now is that something you can insure for um the yeah short answer yes yes so and it's important to to understand exactly what you're talking about so it's it's a breakdown or an incapacitated vehicle in an off-road situation and that, yeah, you said not bogged, but, you know, you might find yourself in a situation where you are bogged and you don't have anyone to get you out. Um, you might have a broken transfer case or, you know, some sort of mechanical damage that mm. renders your vehicle incapable of continuing under its own steam. And that's a really long way of saying breaking down. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, a lot of people in this case think, well, I've got RA, whatever it might be, roadside assistance, platinum or diamond or whatever it might be. And a lot of people rely on that, and they're wonderful products. Um, you know, uh, roadside assistance, I think, is a, is a wonderful add-on to any insurance product or as a standalone. Uh, what, I've, what I would encourage everyone to do is read the product disclosure statement that comes with those, with those products because there isn't one in the country that doesn't have an exclusion for off-road. Now, that doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. I've spoken to long-term customers that have been recovered um, out of very remote places, uh, one story is from The Simpson, um, where they had been with a roadside assistance provider for a great many years, and they actually were, were pulled out of that, and the, and, the, and the cost was covered. But there's also a great number of people who find at their time of need that their roadside assistance product doesn't cover yeah. because it's off-road and a tilt tray can't get out there. So you, you, you need to factor that in, you know. Okay, so that's the difference between saying, look, um, we will come and get you with our roadside assistance versus we don't operate a roadside assistance, but we will ensure that, you know, you will be recovered from wherever it is. Yeah, that's right. Uh, look, our, our product, for argument's sake, uh, you know, uh, we have a off-road recovery cover component that's added onto every policy and you can up that to fifteen or $30,000. Uh, what that what what that covers you for is exactly what we just mentioned before, where it's not a claimable incident. So you haven't had an accident. Yeah. You've broken down. You're in the middle of Simpson. Costs four hundred bucks an hour to get out of there, roughly. Yeah. So how are you going to cover that cost? Our product has an additional benefit that sits above and beyond the motor insurance product for exactly those scenarios. And you know, we've supported. Um, we've supported customers through that for the whole five years. And the, I think the biggest claim um, that we've had was for $18,000 over in WA, where a couple unfortunately found themselves bogged to the sills 100 metres off a, off a track. And they were communicating with us through sat phone. Okay. Um, and we had to send uh, you know, uh, pretty much a, a group of people from Esperance to, to head up there. It took them a day and a half to get there. Yeah. and recover the whole unit back out uh, and bring it home. So, you know, $18,000 is a lot of money for me. You know, that would put an end to your holidays for some time. Yeah. Um, again, ask the question. It depends on, depends on what you're doing with your vehicle too. Okay. All right, good. All right, now let's talk about... Um, so Shannon's had a um, uh, clause the other time about um, reckless driving and water crossings it kind of implied that any form of water crossing was reckless driving wasn't their intent and they clarified it later to to fix that up after i contacted them but um i guess all insurers would have some form of clause saying look if you're being stupid we're not going to pay out yeah you're absolutely right uh the, yeah most pdss do have um you know clauses to that effect so uh, and look it'll talk some of them will have different wording. It might talk to burnout or racing or time trials and, and things like that. Um, all of them will have them to some degree. Yeah. So, again, be armed. You know, do the reading. You know, it's the, you know, the paperwork that you're getting is, is the physical byproduct of your relationship with your insurer. You need to know what's in it. But isn't that a grey area? I mean, if you're going through a water crossing and let's say your car's waiting depth is... Let's say you've got a defender waiting depth for 500 mil 
mm -hmm. um, and you go through water crossing and you've got a fully sealed um, safari snorkel and mm -hmm. it's 700 mil um, some people are saying, well, look, that would be reckless because you've exceeded the limit. Um, I would argue not because I know that the defender is well capable of it, yeah. um, but the insurer could surely make an argument it is reckless, right? Well, that's the grey. Yeah. That's the grey. So I guess the question that I ask myself is, you know, is, is that policy fit for my purpose? Um, you know, do, and again, going back to, what we discussed a little bit earlier about assessing that risk. So um, are you one that does water crossings? You know, are you one that will walk a crossing before you attempt it? Or do you like the adventure of, of, of getting in there? So you need to, you need to assess that risk. Look, water crossings are, are, are an, an interesting one. So we actually, a few years ago, um, launched a specific excess around water crossings. Uh, and, you know, that was off the back of the fact that as a 4 by 4 insurer, all of our customers at some point will do a water crossing. You know, a general insurer um, might have, you know, 5% of their portfolio that actually do this sort of work. So for us at the time, it was how do we do this without penalising everyone? Because, you know, you, you could increase your premiums across the board, not the right way of doing it, because not everyone will, will, will be irresponsible or reckless, as you put it, as they go through that water crossing. Um, do you drop the coverage? Absolutely not, because you can't be a four by four insurer if you do. Uh, or do you encourage people to stop and think before you hit that water? Yeah. Uh, you know. Okay, so, so let's say that, um, I don't know, um, most of, um, I've got a four wheel drive, most of my um, driving is in, um, I guess, in the Victorian, um, desert country, no water crossings around there. I'm yep. pretty happy with that. I don't take the water crossing, but I've mm -hmm. got this one trip to Cape York. Obviously, that is the place for water crossings, and they go, oh, I better put it on. Could I put it on just for two months whilst I do that? Um, look, there's ways to do that. Uh, yeah, uh, I think what you might find is that you need to take up another policy with someone. So, look, if you find yourself in a situation where water crossings are a question mark with your insurer... Yeah. Uh, and you know you're going to go do Nolans, then you know it, it's probably it's probably a good idea for you to find a way to ensure you're covered and you remove that grey. Whether that is cancelling one policy, taking it up with someone else, if you really want to get to that two month mark when you come back and swap it over, that might be something that you might want to do. You know, there's obviously cancellation fees and things like that you, that you need to navigate. Yeah. Um, but you know, if you are going to do it, you need to assess that risk. Like I said ensure that you are comfortable with the level of grey and if you're not, get black and white. Okay, cool. Now, I just want to take Greg's question here, which is, would insurance be different for someone who is just touring, say on outback roads, compared to someone who is doing hardcore four-wheel driving? So, uh, yeah, if I interpret that the right way, Greg, I guess the question you're asking is, um, you know, would would you need a different insurance coverage? And please jump in and, and respond if I haven't interpreted this the right way, mate. But uh, look, I think if, if we go back to what I was saying before, you know, if you are one that is doing more technical four-wheel driving versus someone who is just taking the outback highways and, and getting to those scenic destinations, it is slightly different, you know, but the considerations are, are all the same. So are you covered appropriately for the value of your vehicle? Are you covered for where you're going to go? Um, you know, and, and if you're not, or there's question marks around any of these items, you know, are you comfortable with the level of grey or uncertainty? Mm -hmm. um, there's no difference for us. So Club 4x4 doesn't, doesn't differentiate between someone that you know, might go do the Spanish Steps on the weekend versus you know, going out to you know, the glowworm tunnels or or, uh, you know, something a little bit easier from a touring perspective, uh, sort of out, out this go away. There's no difference for us. So. Okay. All right, good. Yeah, I guess you're kind of spreading the risk in the same way a general insurer would have some, a small amount of four-wheel drivers doing four-wheel drive things and most people just driving to the shops. 
probably got a relatively small amount of people going out doing really high risk stuff, whereas a lot of people would just be doing average four wheel drive touring and it's lower risk, so you can't spread it. Yeah. Okay, good. Now, uh, I noticed that Club 4x4 offer a discount if you've done four wheel drive training. So, has that been found to make a difference to people's claims leveled in? Absolutely, Robert. Okay. Absolutely. So, we, we launched, when we launched the product, we had a um, we had a discount for those who have done off-road driver training. Um, back when we launched it, it was ten percent. So, if we think about how we started this conversation around insurance portfolios and continually yeah. monitoring pricing, I think it was probably about eighteen months ago. Now, part of a regular pricing review, we actually identified that those who have conducted, uh, a, a, you know, a, a, a nationally recognized qualification based off-road driver training through an RTO, which is the criteria that we utilize at the moment. Um, we found that the, the, the claims experience for those who had was significantly better than those who hadn't. I think um, that might be the case because 20% is quite a bit. That, that's really interesting. So now here's a question. Do you think that that is because they have skills um, which allow them not to claim as often or is it due to the mindset of the sort of person who would do training is less likely to claim anyway that's such a good question robert <laughs> that is such a good question I, i'd say it's probably a little bit of both mm. so it's a bit of the chicken and the egg so if you think about the person that would actually go and invest um, in the training there's probably a bit of a mindset there um, around responsibility yeah but yeah. i also think that once the training is conducted you know the mindset changes completely anyway, mm. so it, it sort of has a it, it has a doubling effect. So yeah. I think you know definitely combined from my perspective. Yeah, look, I think it would be. So the ironic thing in motorsports, if you put a safety briefing together, the people that turn up are the people least needing to to, to, to listen to it. Yeah, okay. Um, what other risk factors are there? I mean. Um, I'd hate to ask if, let's say, Nissan owners claim more than Toyota owners or something like that. Anything oh my else? Gosh, that chestnut. Um, look, definitely. So, yeah, there's there's a whole raft of different factors that come into it. Our quoting process is is relatively detailed in comparison to our, to others, yeah. and that's because you know we'll take a seventy thousand dollar seventy nine series and insure it for two hundred thousand dollars every day of the week. That that's what we do. Um, so, in order to to be able to provide the breadth of coverage that we do with our product, there's a whole lot more questions that go into it. Yeah. Um, uh, the Toyota versus Nissan question, motor vehicle types, whether it be brand right down to make and model and series, uh, are all part of the consideration process from a pricing perspective. Um, as an ex-Nissan driver, it pains me to say this, but Toyotas are the largest representation of motor vehicle in our portfolio probably by about 10 or 15%. So, um, you know, uh, and again, if you think about a representation size, you're going to have a larger representation from the claims. Perspective. Well, yeah, it could be interesting to see is a uh, Nissan Y62 patrol owner more or less likely to claim than a 200 series owner mm. uh, versus a Land Rover Defender owner versus whatever else. Just look at that Demo, demographics there and it's because different types of cars attract different <coughs> types of people who probably have different attitudes to risk so it'd be interesting to run some queries on your database there well stay tuned um that's something that we are working on um within the team at the moment what we would like to do um you know moving forward is to is to sort of publish some statistics out there to help people understand i think you know we, we look at stats all day fortunately or unfortunately but yeah. I think that it's really interesting stuff to put out there to the market as well in, 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 the, in the form of a claims index. Yeah. So sure. stay tuned, Robert. Okay, good. All right, great. All right, so um, that's pretty much all I wanted to cover. What advice would you have for people or four-wheel drivers shopping for insurance to, to close off with? Just give us three or four points. Just, just make sure you know what you're buying. So, you know, I, I don't know if I'll get to three or four points, to be honest, Robert. Um, okay. You know, it's make sure you really understand what you're buying because, yes, it's an impost. Yes, you need to pay it. Um, you know, it, it, yeah, it, it is quite costly at times. But just remember that you're actually buying a product, not the piece of paper. Yeah. So be really sure. Remove the grey. Ask another two or three questions. 
if you're not confident with those answers or you can't get the answers, that's usually a pretty good indication you're not in the right place. Okay, great. Oh, well, brilliant. Well, thank you very much. That's been a really informative session. Really appreciate you giving up an hour of your time on, um, on this evening here. Um, thanks everyone who's uh, attended um, to ask the questions and um, participate. And this will be up on my YouTube channel shortly. So, Kaylin, thank you very much again. And um, yeah, happy ensuring. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Robert. All the best, everyone. And you. Thanks. Bye.